everyone, welcome to New Bear. Today we're going to do an exercise in reversing work. The aim is to help anyone who's struggling with reading schematics and understanding when to reverse or not. One of my earlier videos has a small ring chain sample which covers the basics. There's a link for that if you want to have a look. But today is a little different. This is Polly. It's a small motive pattern which I'd like you to have a go at doing by yourself. I'm hoping it will challenge you enough that you have to think about whether you reverse work or not and when you reverse work, what happens to your stitch count. There's a link for the pattern in the description box. You can also find it on my New Bear Facebook page. So this is kind of a tad long, but I want you working the elements yourself. Decide whether you reverse or not and only peek at the video if you're stuck. Before we start working the motive, I want you to think about why we reverse our work in the first place. Understanding why we're doing it will help with knowing when to do it. It's called direction. It's all about direction. Normal rings are always worked clockwise. They always face up. Chains are always worked clockwise they always curve down. So if rings face up and chains face down, the only way we get them sitting in different directions is to manipulate our work. Sometimes we have to work elements upside down or backwards so that when we turn our work right way up, everything is facing the way it's supposed to. So I really hope you guys enjoy this exercise. As we get started, one of the best pieces of advice I can give you, especially if you're doing this because you're struggling with direction, the best thing I can say is check twice, close once. Trying to open a ring can be a real pain. And there's a few rings in here, so before completely closing it, check it. Then you can pull it closed. I'm going to ask you to do a lot of visualising, so visualising how you work your rings and chains. Sounds a bit weird at the moment and no doubt you'll be sick of me saying it by the time we've completed the motive, but it will make sense when we come to do it and hopefully help you with working out whether you need to reverse work or not. My other piece of advice is to tackle one element at a time. Looking at a pattern or a piece of work as a whole piece can be overwhelming that's when the negative thoughts can creep in. They're sneaky little buggers. If they get in your head, you start doubting yourself and thinking you can't do it. But you can do it. It's just rings and chains. Break it down. Concentrate on one element at a time. Everyone ready? Let's go. Starting with ring A, I've worked five, pico two, five times, then pico three and pico two. Going back to our pattern, ring B is the same as ring A. It's also facing up. It's on the same side of the chain as ring A, so it's showing us we need to rotate our work. Occasionally a written pattern will tell you to rotate, but more often than not it will just be written as DNRW, do not reverse work. It's assumed that as a tatter you know you have to rotate it. So after closing ring A, rotate our work slightly to the left. If you visualise making ring B, you can see it's going to sit exactly where we need it to. So we start with two, join back to ring A, and then we're continuing with three pico two five times, pico five. We have A and B. Our next element is a chain which is curving up. If we visualise working our chain from this position, it's going to curve down. But by reversing our work, making our chain on the back, it's going to curve down as it's made. 
So we are chaining five pico two three times, then pico five. When we turn our work back to the right side, our chain is now curving the right way. I'm just going to go back to where we were as if we've just finished working our chain. We're ready to look at ring C. Visualise where this ring will sit if we make it from our current position. It will face up, but it will come off the side of our chain and be pointing out to the right made like that. Reversing our work and visualising our ring, it will sit inside the chain and curve back towards ring B. So after completing our chain, we reverse our work and make ring C with a count of nine, join back to ring B and then we have four pico two Pico 2, Pico 3. Visualise ring D. If we make ring D without reversing our work, we're going to end up with something similar to our first two rings. The ring will come out and sit side by side. We need ring D to sit underneath ring C and face in the opposite direction. Remember that when we work a ring it faces up so by reversing our work ring D will face the right way. Just want to go back to our first three rings for a tick. We worked ring A, ring B and ring C in a clockwise direction. Looking at ring D, you might think we'd work it as 12 pico 8, because that's clockwise. But when we reverse our work to position the ring, our stitch count becomes 8 pico 12. So using our other thread, we always work with the thread that sits on the top. We're working 8 Pico 12. The next chain curves down and over the top of the ring we just made. If we made the chain from here, it would curve down, but when we turn our work to the front, the chain would curve up and over the top. Of ring C. So after ring D we are reversing our work and chaining 20. Ring E faces down at the end of our chain, so again we're reversing work. Similarly to ring D, our stitch count also needs to be reversed. So it's 3, join back to ring D. Then we have 5, pico 1, 3 times, 2, pico 5, pico 2. Ring F is the same as ring E in that it is facing down. So like we did for rings A and B, we're going to 
rotate ready to start our ring but remember we're still on the back which makes our stitch count two join back to ring e five two one one nine If we visualize making an X chain from this position, so there's a couple of things that aren't right. The chain will curve down, which is what we want, but it would follow the curve of this chain, which is this one, instead of curving away from it like it does in the pattern. So if we made our chain from here, when we turn our work over, it's completely opposite to what we need. So as I mentioned before, we're still on the back of our work to get our chain tracking around the outside of ring F. We need to reverse and start our chain with four, then pico two nine times and pico four. Ring G is facing up. We're still facing down after working our chain. So again, visualizing how you're going to work your ring can help you to see if you need to reverse or not. If we work a ring now, it will come out to the right and sit on top of our chain. It's not where we want it. For it to sit underneath, we need to reverse our work. We have eight join to ring f four join to ring e six pico two Ring H kicks off the side of ring G. It's facing the same direction, so we're simply rotating. It's still on the back side, so our stitch count is reversed. We've got two, join back to ring G, three, pico two, pico two, nine, pico two. The next chain is like the one we did before. On our schematic, it's curving down. On our work, it would also curve down until we turned our work the right way up and then we'd have problems. So after our last ring, we're reversing our work and chaining 20. Ring I is coming back towards ring H, meaning from the position of our chain, we need to reverse our work. We're making 12, joining back to H, making 8. Reversing our work for ring J because it sits opposite ring I and on the other side of 
our chain. We're working clockwise with three pico two, pico two, pico four, pico nine. Visualize your next chain. We don't want it curving in towards our work, so we are going to reverse and work five pico two three times, then pico five. Our next ring sits underneath our chain, so we're reversing work for ring K. We have five, we're joining back to ring J, then two, pico two four times, pico three, pico two. Rotate your work to start ring L. We're making two. Joining back to ring K. We have three pico two five times, pico five. Our next chain is coming over the top of our ring. So we reverse work and we have five pico two three times, pico five. Visualize your next ring and how it will sit from this position. We're going to reverse our work to place our ring correctly. Ring M is 9 joined to ring L. We have 4, pico 2, pico 2, pico 3. Ring N sits opposite ring M. So we are reversing and working 8, pico 12. We want our next chain to track around our ring. So again, we reverse our work. And our chain is a count of 20. We are ready for ring O. This ring faces up as it comes off the chain, so it might look like we rotate our work. There's a couple of things telling us we need to reverse our work. Pretend this loop is my ring. Rings are worked clockwise. So our first problem is this join. We'd be trying to join to the underside of the ring. The other problem is that our thread would finish on the underside of the elements, ring and our chain. Our ring thread would finish on this side and our chain thread would be on this side. We need both threads on the top side so that we can continue. So we reverse our work for ring O and we have two joined back to ring N, then nine pico two, pico two, pico three and pico two.
we rotate for ring P. We're working two, turn back to ring O, six, Pico four, Pico eight. Visualizing our chain coming from ring P, we can see it will follow the curve of the previous chain. So we need to reverse our work so our curve will go up. We have four, then Pico two nine times, Pico four. Ring Q is upside down, so we're reversing again and starting our ring with 9, Pico 1, Pico 1, Pico 2, joining back to ring P, and then we have 5, Pico 2. If you visualise our next ring, you'll see we're rotating to set up for ring R. Our count is two, join back to ring Q. We have five, joining back to ring P. Then two, Pico one, Pico one, Pico one, Pico five, Pico three. Our next chain is curving over the top of our last ring. So reverse will work and we are chaining 20. Once again our next ring drops down and joins back to ring R. We're reversing work. We have 12 join back to ring R and finish with 8. Our final ring sits opposite ring S. So we're reversing our work and working 3, Pico 2, Pico 2, Pico 4. We're joining back to ring A with a folded join. If you're not sure how to make a folded join, I've included a link to a detailed video for you. We're finishing our ring with 9. After closing ring T, our final chain needs to curve up. So we are reversing our work. And chaining five, Pico two, three times, Pico five. And that's it. We just need to cut and hide our tails. And we're done. I hope you enjoyed the pattern. I hope it's helped you with understanding why and how we reverse our work or not, as the case may be. We'll see you next time. When I first made this little motif, it was for one of my um, tatting classes in reversing work. Then I looked at it and I thought it's actually kind of cute to have it as a little photo frame. So I'm going to make this into a card and I'm going to tat around the edges of the card. So I thought you might like to see how I attach the tatting to that. I've done my first chain. As you can see, I haven't knotted my thread, so I've just got a nice long tail and I've got two Pico 1, Pico 1 five times and Pico 2.
going to use a lock join to attach this to the card. So I've pre-punched my holes and I'm going to go into the second hole. It is kind of interesting trying to attach something that is really not flexible or attached to something I should say so just position the chain I might tighten that up a little bit so that it sits on top I'm going to continue on with my chain. I find if I hold it to the side it actually <laughs> it kind of helps. And yes I am going to use my Pico gauges. I think that probably makes it harder for myself but if you know me you know I like to use my gauges. Here's my second chain. Go back into the next pre punched hole. back to my first at the start of my first chain I'm going to go through the first hole and pull those threads up I'm actually going to put my tails through that loop and again position the start of my chain And continue my way around the card. When we get to our corner chain we have two double stitches in between each pico and we're going to join back to the hole in the corner so joining to this hole twice And now continue on as we were before. So I've made my way all the way around and tied off at the end like I did at the start. I'm just going to wait the base of that down. I'm going to tie a sliding knot here to get rid of my tail. So a sliding knot is used when they make um, leather bracelets and things like that so I don't know how we're going to go with using thread but we'll give it a crack so we're going to cross our threads over and loop this one back on itself 
and popping in a magic loop facing the other way just over the top and then using the tails from so that's the tails from the loop it's hard to see with the same color thread isn't it loop it over and I want to use these tails these in there and I'm wrapping around the threads so you want to do three or four wraps A lot, <laughs> a lot easier if you're using leather instead of thread. Need more fingers to hold on to everything. Okay, when you've wrapped it three or four times and it stays wrapped. We want to get our loop and pass your tails up through that loop. I know it's hard for you to see, but if I let this go, I'm going to lose my loops. So I've got my wraps under there and my tails through the magic loop. And we're going to gently pull those tails through our wraps so you want them loose enough that you can pull the tail through but not so loose that you're going to lose the lot and then we can pull that down to secure that knot now the idea of the sliding knot is obviously that it will slide but we don't want ours to slide I want that to secure my thread so I've tightened everything up we're going to tie this side exactly the same so loop it back and loop it reasonably close normally for a sliding knot you'd have a bit of space between this knot and your second knot as I said so it can slide but I don't want this one to slide so I'm going to do it pretty close put my loop in going the other way and again, we're going to wrap four or five times. Your tails through the loop. Got my wrap stitches here. And gently pull them through those wraps. I'm going to have to work them a little bit. Of my other knot, which was clever. Now, unfortunately, that's pulled that far too loose, so I might actually rewrap that one. But once you're done, you can cut your threads and your tails have disappeared. So my second attempt is much better and of course it's the one I didn't film. Anyway, I showed you how to do it before. Now I'm just going to cut my tails off nice and close. And 
some then on the outside. We're going to have my little Tassie. the little frame. That's it. See you next time.